I hate to interrupt the good conversation, but we need to get started. And our speaker today is Iona Baldridge, and here's my funny story about her. Some of you know that they tell those stories about the old days with Les Perrin, that I always look at the people around me and say, let's start playing games in the student union building. Uh, I'm not a 42 player, but I'll be there if you want to trivia your pursuit or whatever. And they used to have a quartet a long time ago. And we were having a school activity of some sort. And I asked, <laughs> and I asked um, Iona if she would get a quartet together. Do you remember that? I remember when we sang out there. Uh -huh. They sang out and we had a picnic and Iona and three other faculty members sang for a quartet and it was great. And I thought, we're going to start that tradition, but I think no, it was yeah, only yeah. one year. It was a men's quartet. <laughs> uh, anyway, Iona and I have been friends for a long time and uh, she's uh, known as a great teacher and uh, uh, a good friend to many. Uh, she has served on tons of committees with a lot of you, so I know that you know her. Oh, here's Mr. Chair. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> so I know that you'll enjoy hearing from my owner, and um, it's going to be yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. As you've come in, I've been watching, and, I, and until Jesse and David Boyer came in, I uh, have experience outside of today with you. Jessica and Toby, now Tim, and who else have I taught? Barbara have all been in my classes. Sean was good friends with my daughter. My husband did the wedding pictures for Gonzalo. <laughs> oh, yeah, and we were at Rana and Brian's wedding. Um, we did pictures too? Well, I didn't remember that. Um, <laughs> Dana's son and my son were in school together. Uh, we sat at many junior high basketball, uh, football games together. Um, I, I guess I went to New Orleans with Jesse, but there were other people too. <laughs> um, Barbara was in my class. We went to Ron and Brian's wedding. They went to Vandalia when they got married. We're in our college group. Um, Carol's mother was my daughter's junior high teacher. I guess David's wife, or his in-laws, uh, Phyllis was a hostess at my wedding shower. Of course, Elaine was my very, very dear friend, and I have other things to talk about them. Susan had both my kids in English. Andy's dad was at ACU Aggie Club when my daddy was Aggie of the Year in 1969. Kurt and... Uh, this one, Paula, <laughs> were in school when I was. So, man, you just can't get out of the loop. And weirdly and, related. And, and weirdly related through, our, um, through marriages. And as I went through all of this, it's kind of uh, introspective. And as I went through it, I realized much more than I'd ever thought how much LCC and LCU has been uh, a part of my life. And it almost starts from the very beginning. And I'm going to stay with my script so I don't wander off and say something I don't want to say and have to go forward in chapel or something like that. <laughs> so, I was the firstborn child of Daryl and Joanne McCasland Clevenger, who lived in Abilene at the time. My dad had just graduated from ACC, and when I was six days old, we made the trek to Tulia, Texas, which was my dad's hometown, and he was going to farm for Bill Cox. Bill Cox if you've been here a long, long time, would know that he was a LCC trustee for many, many years, almost until he died, uh, probably in the 90s. But he was an important part of our life. I was a happy only child. I wanted to remain that way. But alas, my parents had other plans for us. Uh, my mom especially wanted a large family. She had grown up in an orphanage, had lots of people around her all the time, and so she really wanted to have more children than she actually did. So when I was almost three, my sister Deanne entered the picture. She eventually became the cute one, and I was relegated to being the smart one. 
And we still hold those titles, and I'm having a sad face right now because I always wanted to be the cute one and the smart one, and I never have understood why it can't be that way. So I have to be now the good one. Uh, and a year and a half after Dee was born, then our brother Dwayne uh, entered the picture. We moved uh, from uh, north of Tulia to south of Tulia into the area where all the Sharps, as in Marsha Sharp, Sharp family lived, and my dad rented a place from one of the Sharps. My best friend from first grade through uh, 12th grade was a Sharp, and uh, so still friendships there. And that was about the time I started to school at Hart, Texas. There was no kindergarten at that time. I was underprivileged, so I started in first grade. It was during that, that year, when I was in first or second grade, that LCC had their groundbreaking here, and we were here. I don't understand. My parents were alums of ACC, but they were very interested in LCC. And so we came uh, not only to that groundbreaking, but when they opened Katie Rogers Hall, we made another trip to see and go through the Katie Rogers Hall. And I was so impressed because we'd only lived in small houses and, and those rooms just looked so marvelous. I mean, their own beds for each person um, <laughs> and a dresser, everything like that. I just couldn't wait. And, and that really got me enthused. Uh, so I really did get my introduction to LCC quite early. We eventually moved on further south, closer to Hart, and then my dad bought a half section and we put a house down. We built it in Lubbock, had it moved and sat down over a basement. And my parents still lived there. And my uh, nephew now farms my dad's place. My life became much more fun about the time I entered high school. I came to a two-week music camp here at LCC in the summer of 1965, and while I was there, I met Neil, who I would eventually marry. I mean, you can see why I was not in love with him right then. <laughs> and that was after. <laughs> I should have gotten an earlier picture, but I also uh, was a roommate of Judy Saunders, Oregon. She brought her own six-pack of Cokes in bottles, which that was such a treat for us. We would never get one every day. And she brought her own six-pack. Um, and then I also met Doug and Emily Perrin, Carl Cope, Lynn Harms, Patrice Byram Marshall, were all some that I still see pretty often um, from that 1965 time. Lester Perrin taught me to lead singing. Um, still haven't gotten to use that in a mixed company, but I have used it a time or two at ladies' retreats. And then later that freshman year, the first of what I consider two life-changing traumas occurred. Five of us, teenagers and one of their mothers, went to Dalhart to a youth rally, and that was about three hours from Hart. We were 15. Uh, Lauren and I were 15, and we had, she had just gotten her driver's license because in Texas at that point you could get your driver's license at 15. And so I had only been 15 for two weeks, and my mother wasn't driving. And so Lauren was driving us back from Del Hart to Hart, and for some unknown reason, she chose not to stop at the stop sign at Highway at Route 66 in Vega. And so we were hit, and, and my memory, and I, I can't even analyze where this came from, it was a black, a small black old car with two little old ladies in it. And maybe someone told me they were two little old ladies. I don't know. They weren't injured or anything. But my, my friend Lauren was killed in that wreck. She was thrown out. I was thrown out. And I was critically injured. They thought I probably would not make it through the night. Uh, but I was very concerned when I came to. I was screaming to get me up off the pavement. We were, as I mentioned, thrown out of the car. And um, I had everyone looking for my watch. I would got my first woman's watch for Christmas. It wasn't a Timex, you know, with the strap on band. It was a pretty silver watch and it had gotten torn off my arm. So everyone that would come by and see me, I'd say, could you look for my watch? And eventually they found it. It never worked again, but they, they found it. And the second thing was even more traumatizing to me. When I got to the hospital and they started um, treating me, um, I, it dawned on me that I wasn't going to be able to be in school on Monday and I was going to break my perfect attendance record after six years. Oh, I was just crushed. Um, but I, I got over it. I was in the hospital only a week. Um, I have scars there, um, mostly physical, a little bit mental. I always remember March 12th. Um, 
we didn't know much about depression at that time, and I would come home from school and lay in my room and just cry for about an hour before I could get up and do anything. And, you know, here all these years later, well, of course, it was a pretty traumatic event. But what it did do is it really cemented my popularity in school. So that was okay. Um, um, let's see. Then, during my high school years, I discovered that I enjoyed the sciences. I liked the teacher that taught biology particularly, chemistry not so much, and I loved English, grammar. Don't like literature too much, but I love grammar still. I'm a, I'm a closet grammarian. <laughs> but being a child, a female of the 60s, I also knew I only had three options as a brief career should the need arise. That is, failing, um, failing to become a stay-at-home wife and mother which we were all expected to be. But I could be a teacher, or I could be a nurse, or I could be a secretary. It was an easy choice, as I'd always been the teacher when we played school at home with my siblings. And my senior year, by my senior year actually, I determined I wanted to teach in college, preferably a junior college, because I had experience at LCC. Uh, I also knew that I would, be choosing, I would choose a Christian college. My parents did not insist on it, but that they did that. That just seemed obvious. And so I knew I had LCC, ACC, and OCC as possibilities. And so I thought coming from a small school with just, you know, some close friends, but not too many, well, I was just going to give them all a try. I was going to make everyone happy, and I was going to go a year at OCC, then transfer to LCC for a year, <laughs> because it was still a two-year college, and then I would finish out at ACC my last two years. Never ever dawned on me that there would be relationships there that would make it very difficult to, you know, go from one place to another. So I decided I would start at OCC, but before that, after graduation, in fact, a week after graduation, in which I was the salutatorian, here is another sad face, my goal my whole life was to be valedictorian. If I'd only played basketball, I could have been a valedictorian, but I can't. I was the manager, so I didn't make as good of grades in PE as the basketball players did. Aww. I know. I am bitter. I am very bitter. And our superintendent, we got a new superintendent my senior year, and her daughter played basketball. And so she had 93s in PE, and I had 90s. And so she beat me by less than half a point. Again, I'm very bitter. <laughs> a week after that, though, I came to LCC for the summer, for summer school, and that was the most sun, fun summer of my entire life. We lived in, on, in the dorms. There were about a hundred of us, and I don't know if there were more boys or girls or even, but we ate in the cafeteria every meal together. It was just a great deal of fun. I took history and government, history from Lester Perrin and government from Henry Lynch. I was the secretary of the biology department that summer because they only had one biology teacher, John Hay Jr. It was in the barracks. And like I said, I just had a great, great time. My roommate the first six weeks was Myrna Deer. My roommate the second six weeks was Peggy Darling. So I thought that was pretty much fun as well. And they're both still good friends all these years later. Nonetheless, I had committed to OCC, so in August, I packed up all my stuff in my unair conditioned baby blue Mustang and headed to Oklahoma City. I only knew one other person there, and that was a guy I had met the summer. He had just graduated from LCC, and he was looking, trying to decide where to go to finish his education, so he uh, decided he'd go to OCC with me. And it didn't take us very long there until we realized that friendships there were not going to be like friendships here. It just was not quite as much fun. So we only lasted one semester. And we tucked our tails in and came back to Lubbock, which was okay because Neil and I had started dating that summer. We had had a pen pal relationship from freshman year all the way through. When he'd break up with a girl, he'd start writing me letters. And uh, it was okay. You know, we ever, everybody wrote letters then. And we had started dating more that summer, and it became a little more serious than I had intended it for it to come. So I came back to LCU, LCC still, and uh, Neil and I became engaged later that year, and we married uh, when we were just sophomores and 20 years old. I know, we were babies. We were babies. Um, I was still majoring in secondary education, 
with my specialties as history and biology. Uh, when I did my student teaching at Coronada, this is not my script, so I hope it doesn't get me out of trouble. I was uh, uh, a student taught in history, but I never taught a single class. Um, whatever his name was, let me teach so, um, current events one day. <coughs> but what I remember about, two things actually I remember about that. One, I studied for the GRE every day while he was teaching, and I was getting credit for student teaching. <laughs> and we were in the barracks at Coronado one time, and it was very hot. And in all seriousness, I don't think he ever knew the difference. He stood up, and he was talking. He said, you know, I think we're just going to die of heat prostitution. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so that has just been one of those little funny phases, funny phrases that I, I still like to use a lot. So growing up, I, I hadn't heard of very many colleges, number one, except ACC. Uh, I don't remember having a knowledge that tech even existed, even though we only lived about an hour away until I was a, a freshman in high school and Donnie Anderson was the big man on campus. Um, but I'd always been a UT fan because my mother grew up in Oklahoma and at my house, October was when there was the big rivalry, OU and UT. Well, I was born in Texas. I, there was no way I was going to be an OU fan. And so I, I just knew more about, about UT. But I didn't know anything about graduate school. I'd never heard of graduate school, as far as I can recall, until we came to school. And Neil had been interested in going to graduate school. And he had good enough grades that he got fellowship offers from um, University of Texas, from A&M from Ohio State, and we just chose University of Texas. We went to Austin over spring break, got to view the campus and everything, and, and um, one of the professors there told Neil he'd like him to work with him, and so that's what we did. Off we went, um, off we went to Austin. So this kind of began my teaching career. I was not eager to teach in Austin, I don't know why, maybe it was because I substituted the last semester while um, my, I actually graduated in December of 72, but there was not a summer, uh, December graduation, so I didn't walk until, until May. So that, that interim, while Neil was finishing, I substituted in um, high school and junior high in Lubbock, and, and maybe that only furthered my desire to teach in college rather than um, in public schools especially. So I didn't apply to teach in Austin, uh, but I did apply kind of late to um, in the Masters of Science Education program at UT and was accepted to do that, but it was too late to get a fellowship or anything like that. So I took a couple of courses at Tech in the summer, graduate courses in biology, and, uh, uh, and then went ahead and finished my Master of Arts in Science Education at UT the next year. My experience there was to TA for a couple of teachers in anatomy and physiology, but mostly I sat in class, had office hours, and graded tests, which was okay. That's what they paid me for, so that made me happy. About the time I finished, I became pregnant, and I had Lisa, our first child, and so I still didn't enter the workforce, and still that was okay because, you know, mothers were meant to stay home with their babies. Um, a year later, we returned to Lubbock. Neil um, wanted to to try his hand at a computer job, even though he had finished his PhD in analytical chemistry, which he's not used one time to this day. <laughs> <laughs> but he learned how to work computers while he was working on it, and that's what he fell in love with. So we returned to Lubbock. I did a little bit of catering. I, I catered for some luncheons, and I catered for some big luncheons for 300 people, things like that. My mama would help me, and then I had my next child, a, a boy, Stephen, um, and before he was born, while I was pregnant with him, I, I, I'm sure Dr. Estep entered into this, he had me handling the chemistry and physics lab over here. I was not qualified to teach either. I'd only had general chemistry, never have had physics, but I was a good babysitter. Um, and so that I got them through that year, which is what they needed. When Stephen was a year old, I can still remember the day Dr. Estep knocked on the door and came in in the front hall and asked me if I was interested in teaching part-time biology. Well, since that had been my goal, my whole adult life, I said yes, and, and Neil had no problem with that. And Dr. Limley was the dean at that time, and he's the one that did the actual interview and, and hired me. 
That first year I had two classes of about 100 students each. I have no earthly idea of what we did with them in lab. 200. So I know we had some not labs, um, but I was a horrible teacher. I, you know, to teach, you really have to learn material, you really need to teach it. And we're just now kind of getting in on that curve for our students. Uh, so it, it might take me 15 minutes to get through a whole chapter. And so I'm sure they loved it because they were out of class all the time. And so I learned then to put notes on transparencies and give them time to copy it, and that kind of lasted until I kind of knew the material, and, and so it went much better. Uh, my first paycheck, I used to buy a microwave. Took the whole paycheck. <laughs> uh, that's how small the paycheck was and how expensive microwaves were at the same time. That was the year we also started our, our football program here, and we went to all the home games. And this is, reminds me of one of the funny stories. I have several funny stories. Most... Um, have to do with um, typographical errors, but this one uh, had to do with football players, and there were, there were two in this class. There were probably more, but these two I remember. One uh, was, I think his name was Mitch Rohr, and he was from Silverton, and then he had a friend maybe from San Antonio, and this was the lab where we typed blood. So they'd have to use their own little lancet and stab their finger. Well, their hands were callous from playing football, being burly and all of that. Mm -hmm. And so they kept stabbing their fingers and no blood. Everybody finished, but it was just Mitch and his friend. And so um, um, we had stabbed. I had them run their hands under warm water to try to get the blood close. Nothing. I had them milk their fingers. Nothing. And then one of us, I don't remember which one, got the idea, you know, how to do this. Well, these old guys were really going to get into it. And so here they go. Huh, huh, huh. And all those little holes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was blood all the way around the room. I went in there a while ago to see if it was still on the ceiling. I knew that the walls had been painted since then, but even the, the ceiling tiles had been have been replaced, but that, that, was, that was kind of funny. <laughs> I remained part-time, teaching part-time until Stephen started to school. I had to beef up my graduate hours in biology. At that point, Sack said you had to have 18 graduate hours in biology, and I only had eight. And so I took 10 more hours at Tech, but I didn't give any thought, really, to finishing my PhD. I didn't want to spend my time in lab, all, that much time in lab, and statistics scared me to death. Uh, it just didn't sound fun. I, I've never loved math. I've been okay at math, but I've never loved it. So I, di I, didn't, I didn't follow through. And now that reminds me of a second story. And this one is not really funny. Um, it kind of is, and then it's kind of sad. Um, students would come, when you're young, students come to your office and they want to visit with you and, and be personal with you. And I've had students, I had some, this isn't on here either. Uh, one of the first things that, that really shocked me is I had a, a, an Iranian student, one of my first two or three years. And I think he was married, but he wanted only boy children. He did not want girl children. And he came to my office and asked how he could make sure that there would be only boys born to him. <laughs> So I said, I'm, I'm so sorry. Uh, there is just no way you can't tell by looking <laughs> or anything else to do that. And another time, another young man came in. He was, and I guess because he was short, but he was very, very muscular is why I remember he was short because you wouldn't think, think this. But he came in and he closed the door and he said, can you tell me if there's a way to, is there a shot that I can take so that I won't produce any more testosterone? Well, he was just 18 or 20. And I said, well, I don't know of, but, you know, why would you want to do that? Well, he was a member of ROTC at Tech, and his sergeant or the, the person in charge of it was a female, and she was insisting that um, he have sex with her, and he didn't, he didn't want to be able to do that. He could, I guess he couldn't turn it down, but he would just would want to say, well, I would, but I can't. And so that was, that was kind of sad. Um, so, but it's kind of funny on the other hand, too, because that was before sexual harassment was illegal. Um, so, back to my story. The day that Stephen graduated from high school was the day I started Tech's School of Education. I knew 
Uh, I did not have the time nor the inclination to finish in biology. This is simply a vanity degree. And, and or, but, I also thought I might want to be dean someday. It didn't look too hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it looked important. I wanted to be important. So I chose higher ed administration. I knew I wasn't going to be in uh, student services. And I sure wasn't going to be in computers. So that was about the only other option. There were three options in higher education. During my second semester of school, my daughter Lisa got married. The next semester is when I began my, isn't it called your residential year where you have to complete 24 hours within a calendar year? Well, I did that. So during that first year of my 24 hours, uh, Lisa told us uh, at Thanksgiving she was having twins. And three days later came the second life-changing event that I went uh, to have a sonogram for an unusual mammogram and was diagnosed with breast cancer. This completely blew me away. I never, ever, oh, I forgot to show that one. I'm so sorry. That's our true colors. <laughs> There's no history in my family of cancer. I was going to be a grandmother. I was in school. Stephen was in college. How could I die and leave all that behind? I was totally ignorant about cancer. You know, I don't even think I knew the difference in chemotherapy and radiation. That's how pathetic I was. Because it wasn't going to happen to me. It didn't happen in our family. Um, during the year of treatment, I remained in school full time. I still taught full time. And after the twins were born in April, I drove to Odessa at least once a week to see the very premature twins. Um, amazingly, and by the grace of God, I missed one day because I was absolutely too tired to go to class, and that was the day after the twins were born. So I really missed two days. The day we went to Odessa and the twins were born, and the next day when I had to recuperate from that. So I was, I was very, very blessed. And you can see from that, there's Susan. There's Keith, there's Dana, Jenny Crockett, Jane Clark, Beth Robinson, Neil, um, Nelda Rogers, and I, I don't know who's behind her, do y'all know? That guy behind Neil and Nelda. Brenda Cass, she was the team captain that year. Two years later, I graduated from tech, and I decided I did not want to be a dean. Um, <laughs> and 15 years later, here I stand, totally blessed. I survived that experience with nearer and dearer friends. So basically, my roots were fertilized by LCC 50 years ago. I came to at least three summer camps during high school, several youth rallies here on campus. Uh, for finally, a student and a graduate. From age 18 until now, there have only been four years that I've not been actively involved on campus. Three of those, I was in Austin, and then the year I came back. Uh, I met my husband here, and he's a graduate. Both my children are alums, and my son is a graduate. My sister is an alum. My brother is an alum of the auto mechanic school here. Um, so it's been a long time coming. Su Susan mentioned that this is my 35th year I'm completing. I started here as a, a very immature 28-year-old, and I will remain until I either wear out, develop Alzheimer's, or Social Security will stop. Then I'm out here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, questions? Well, I'll ask the first question, okay. as is usual. Uh, your first check you used to buy a microwave? Uh -huh. it was, oh, my goodness. I don't remember, $300 maybe? Yeah. I mean, you know, it was one of those, the size of a console TV. Yeah. Wow. And I would go to um, one of the bakery thrift shops and buy 10 like fried pies, rolls, things like that for a dollar, and we would microwave them. I don't know how much weight I gained that semester, <laughs> <laughs> but it was some, yeah. So did your children ever contemplate going someplace else? I, we really didn't give them the choice. <laughs> So it was an economic decision, and they had been to Encounter their whole lives. It, it, you know, like our students that go to Encounter, they think it's going to be summer camp. Yeah. Yeah. And so they both had a good time. 
You brought your dissertation, but you didn't tell us about it. Well, it's because I don't remember much about it. <laughs> Kurt and Donna helped me. Um, I can tell you, basically, it was called a descriptive comparison of the organization of life science curricula in liberal arts colleges. And what it was is we were trying to determine, and I had no clue what to write about. I just wanted to write about something and get through, and my major professor was with me on that. And so um, what we looked at was um, the, the 10, um, I think it was the 10, no, the 20 best USA ranked schools to see if they were emphasizing pre-med over just general biology. Is that what you remember? <laughs> yeah, I got, I got the physical catalogs from all of those universities. We looked through all of their science courses and we, we marked whether they emphasized medicine over just general biology or whatever. I mean, it was, it was fun because I understood what I was doing. And so. Someone else? Yes. Okay, so you said that LCC was a junior college mm -hmm. when you decided to go there, but then you graduated with your bachelor's degree? So In the second graduating class. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The first, the first year was 72, and I was 72 and a half. So, because I'd gone to summer school a couple of summers. Second summer wasn't so much fun. <laughs> Neil wouldn't let me date. <laughs> it's rude that way. <laughs> so what else? All right. Well, I, then I have one more question. Oh, okay. I'm dying to know this since we have all these new science teachers. <laughs> How has teaching science changed over the years? My, my teaching hadn't changed very much at all, I'm sad to say. Every year I intend for it to. <laughs> <laughs> and for two weeks it does. <laughs> um, well, it's funny. I was looking. Uh, it's changed a little bit. I think we're gradually figuring out how much, how important the lab experience is, even though that's probably what we hate doing the most. Um, I was looking, I wrote in my master's, it wasn't a thesis, it was a research report about uh, the curriculum in science, uh, teacher education in the curriculum in science education. And I was just looking at the, at the bibliography and I saw something about competency-based, performance-based, um, and I thought, oh, things aren't changing at all. Um, they just call them different things. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I know that especially this year uh, in one of my majors classes, I have a young lady who has taken it on herself at, to have a study group. And her study group makes about 10, on average, 10 points higher than the rest of the class. And she brings hands-on things. She brought a plant once to the study group. And I, none of us have been, have we? Y'all didn't go, did you? But you know that. Anyway, uh, the students say, you know, I couldn't get it. And then she made me say it to her and it started to click. And I know that, I know that. I've done lifestyle, uh, learning styles. That's one of my things I've loved a lot, but I just can't make that big jump. And now I'm too old, I'm an old dog. We don't do new tricks. Um, so, but I know if they, would, if they would figure out to teach it themselves, that's, that's the key, that is the key. So uh, that's when I learned it. It wasn't when I was in college. <coughs> so I kept my notes. I don't know why. Yes, sir? You, you made a comment that uh -oh. was intriguing to me. Uh -oh. So I would like for you to clarify a little more. You said there were times, I think you said, when you were first starting to teach, because you may have been young, that you were having a lot of students come see you. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's what you meant. Yes. I, and, and, and has that, does that decrease? Struggle is not a word that I really want to use, but I, I, I feel like it with does. This. I feel like when I was young and I looked really young, they maybe thought that I identified with their problems a little more than maybe a grandma does now. Because I don't have very many students, unless they're non trads, come in to talk to me anymore. 
And that's kind of sad because I'm not judgmental. I was probably far more judgmental then, but now I take pills for that. <laughs> <laughs> and nothing. There are no sharp edges on anything. And I think I could probably be a really good mentor, but I'm also less extroverted than I used to be. And, and so it's not that I won't listen to them. It just, they just don't come. But like I said, a lot of the non-trads, some of those that are closer to my age will still come and talk to me. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's okay that they feel like they can talk to me and not a child like you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I, I miss it too. I miss it too. I, I think the last really, the class that my daughter was in, the majors class, was probably the class that I was the closest to. They would come to my house for studying and all of that, even though Lisa wasn't in that. Uh, the class around Stephen's age was when I was undergoing cancer and the treatment and another scare. And they would, they sent me a cookie bouquet. They brought me gifts and things like that. And that was, that was really neat. It was really neat. So I don't know if I've just if I just give off the vibe of being closed off, and, and I'm sure I do. I mean, most people think I'm very reserved and quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Never been a good description of me. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, I was about to not ask the question after all, because it isn't as much to do with you as it is with Neil. Is it okay if I ask you a sure, question? Okay, sure. I've always been curious about this. So. You said he went to get his PhD in biology, but then by the time he chemistry. finished mm -hmm. chemistry, and then he decided to do something different. What was he wanting to do when he did go to get his PhD? He thought he would work for uh, a big company like Houston, Dallas, something like that. Um, but it, um, when he started with the computers, there was one building on campus that had a computer. You know, that was they all were wired, hardwired into that. Uh, all of his data for his dissertation were on cards. Mm -hmm. um, he would make me go and play Star Trek on the computer. With, mm -hmm. I've never even watched Star Trek. All I remember is the word Klingons. You know, and I don't know how you played it, but it was nothing, nothing like anything now. Um, but he just became intrigued with the computer part of it. Mm -hmm. And so when we, it, he and his brother, uh, were going to start some sort of business. Mm -hmm. And they worked for about three or four months, and they just weren't, it just wasn't falling into place. And Marvin Crossnow, he had been Neil's math teacher um, when he was in school, um, asked Neil and David if they would want to, to do something together. And yep, here, that was 77, mm -hmm. and still going strong. So. Changed direction several times, but he's getting a paycheck. I'm happy. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you, Dr. Ball. Yes. Oh. <laughs> Yours and, and some of Lynn's. Yeah. Yeah. Larry Millard and Brian Privet. Yeah. Bruce Gilstrap. Yeah. Uh, seems like we've had somebody working down there all the time, but we really, really appreciate you for that. Well, they, I heard Neil say not too long ago he was going to call Lynn and see if he had any, she had anybody he could send her. Yeah. And I don't think she sent Alyssa Middleton, but I think Alyssa just is getting started maybe this week. So. Yeah, she started Tuesday, two, Wednesday. Yeah. 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 But she heard about the job from Leticia, who was one of your math majors, I think. Huh. Yeah. So Leticia is there. And, I think she heard it from the side. Yeah. Well, that's good for me. That might mean Neil's gone one less week. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Bond. Sure. Thank you.